Uh, brothers and sisters, we are gathered again in uncertain times where now we, we are now getting used to preach the word and to even pray using social media. So we want to thank God for helping us and guiding us to do what we are doing. So I just pray that uh, as you are going to hear the word of God, uh, your spirit will be uplifted. And I pray that your life will never be the same again. You'll be someone changed, not through me, but by the word of God. May God help you this very moment. Let us pray. Jesus Christ broke the barriers that divide us. In him we are one. By him we are offered peace. Through him we can see God. Let our worship be a sign of this saving work. Let our worship show that Christ has saved us. The church, which is the body of Christ, is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. We are members together of this mighty and all-encompassing church. We belong to God. Come now to worship. Hear the reading of the word of God. Hear the sharing of the word of God. Even through the prayers. May God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to call my brother, Ben, to come forward and do the reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Please listen very carefully. Thank you. God bless. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's just an amazing, amazing day and just so amazing to um, have a relationship with Jesus. It's uh, just, just so amazing from where we were before we knew Jesus to coming to know him and then forming that relationship. And yeah, it's just this, just, just this thing that is undescribable, I suppose, but um, it's by our actions, I suppose, that we can just just really uh, shine that glory of God. Um, and I hope you're all well as well. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, Ephesians 2, uh, 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. By now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. He, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For those... But for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Wow. We, uh, we're, we're the temple of God and the Holy Spirit lives in those who are born again. So that's just amazing. Uh, powerful scripture. Going to have to be a powerful sermon. So let's get Johnson back to hear it. Praise God. Have a good week. Brothers and sisters, we want to thank God 
especially this morning. And um, my theme, the one I've chosen to share with you this morning, is let the dividing walls come down. In Christ, let the dividing walls come down. The Apostle Paul put it this way, here is peace, here is our peace, who has made the two one, and destroying, destroy the dividing wall of hostility. Let's ponder this for a moment. Wars are real. Hostility is horrific. The walls which Paul refers are the walls of the J Jerusalem temple. In the house of God, there was a place for Gentiles, a place for women, a place for priests, and a place for the Holy of Holies. To get out of your place meant sudden and certain death. The hostility Paul refers, references is between Jews and Gentiles. Jews hated Gentiles. It was unlawful to help a Gentile woman in need. Better for her to die than run the risk of bearing a child. To enter the house of a Gentile, a Gentile was to render a Jew unclean. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl, the funeral of that Jewish boy was conducted, he was as good as dead. The walls are real and the hostility is horrific. The right of Ephesians begins by noting a central religious distinction between the people of Jesus and the rest of the world by circumcision. So he knows that it is a world ritual for females done by humanity, yet it has a religious power. Therefore, remember that formerly you are Gentiles, by birth are called uncircumcised, in quotes, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, that is in verse 11. Though other cultures practiced circumcision at the time of Ephesians, the people of Jesus added the religious dimension. It was a sign of the covenant with Yahweh, the God who had brought them out of slavery in Egypt, the God who had chosen them to be God's people. So for Judaism, circumcision of males recalled the covenant that God had made with Abraham and Sarah, a covenant in which God had claimed them and their descendants as God's special people, a light to the nations, as Isaiah called them in Isaiah 42 verse 6. So the people who were not claimed in this way were called Gentiles. In the New Testament, translating a Greek word meaning the nations, people from other nations. So the Bible has various opinions of the Gentiles. Several New Testament portraits show Gentiles who are God-fearing and admirable, such as the centurion in Luke chapter 7, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and the woman who begs Jesus for healing for her daughter in Matthew 15. For the most part, however, the Gentiles were seen as puggers at best and as dogs at worst. Even Jesus called them dogs in Matthew 15's passage. His scout had taught him that Gentiles were not his people and more importantly were not God's people. So that is Jesus' point in defending his refusal to acknowledge the Gentile woman's request for healing in Matthew 15 verse 26. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to dogs. So this basic distinction was seen most vividly in the temple where a wall divided the court of the Gentiles from the space reserved for the Jewish people. In Acts chapter 2, uses the word aliens to describe the Gentiles. Those outside the wall were called aliens. So in today's passage, the author of Ephesians makes a direct attack on those kinds of divisions. And he affirms that in Jesus Christ, there is a whole new vision a whole new world that we are asked to enter and to explore. So he proclaims that God has broken down the dividing walls in Jesus Christ and in this movement we are called into new life. To see ourselves and to see others in a new way. That each of us, all of us are now children of God belonging to the same household. So this proclamation is both bad news and good news. We are acquainted with the divisions that Ephesians is addressing. There are divisions on which we all tend to base our lives and the divisions upon which we depend 
Jews and Gentiles, black and white, brown, male and female, poor and rich, Australians and non-Australians, illegal aliens, that's that word again, and citizens, terrorists and law-abiding citizens. Ephesians tells us that these divisions that seem so important to us no longer are valid in Jesus Christ. That Christ has broken down the dividing walls of hostility. Like circumcision, there are distinctions created by human beings, not by God. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Love finds a way to span the gap from one side to another. Everybody has a part in it. So this should be astonishingly good news. But we often hear it as bad news because it calls into question the categories of our lives. We put ourselves in categories. We put ourselves in classes. We live in the time of the gated community. It's the sign of an exclusive neighborhood. High walls, a gate across the entrance. Sometimes a guard, most of the time, is for security. We understand that everyone wants to be secure. Even in the church, there are walls. We don't like to admit, but it's true. The war in St. Paul is referring into specifics, the war between Jews and Gentiles. The first Christian congregation was all Jewish. And most of the members would have preferred to keep it that way. People are still building walls of discrimination, walls of hostility. Christ says to us, tear down these walls. Remove these walls. But Simon Peter had a vision, and St. Paul had a passion. Together they broke down the wall that kept Gentiles out. They began to understand that Jesus didn't like walls, any kind of walls, particularly walls that made some people feel inferior or rejected. Because as you become a Christian, all people matter. Everyone matters. Jesus fought the battle of Golgotha. And the walls came down trembling and the war between Jews and Gentiles, the war between men and women, the war between people of different colors, the war between saints and sinners were destroyed. So the dividing walls of hostility have been broken down and all people are now welcomed in the house of our God. All people, not just special ones. All people, not light-skinned or dark-skinned. All people, not comfortable or poor. Breaking down the dividing wall is not an easy task. It's a difficult task. So the dividing walls became deeply rooted in our identities and in our imagination and breaking them down is difficult. The dividing walls are not melted down by the glorious and radiating sun, light of God's love. The dividing walls are broken down by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is costly and painful. Only by the blood of Jesus. If you are washed by the blood of Jesus, you are able to fight the dividing walls we find in our world today. I was just reading and find out that in the world there are 77 dividing walls in the world. The Great War of China. The one in America which has been put so that it divides the Mexicans from the Americans. There are dividing walls that are put by the world. I think this is why the author of Ephesians uses the image of the household of God. In these verses, rather than the kingdom of God or the reign of God, it is one thing to say that we are all welcomed into the kingdom of God. We live with that. You stay in your part of the kingdom, and I'll stay in my part of the kingdom. That is what it is, the dividing wall. However, the focus here is on household, a home, a place where those who were once enemies now live together, where they share the kitchen table, where they share the bathroom, where now... It, it is a different story. It is so much more difficult. When now you are able to live together with your enemy, sharing the meals with your enemy, and the dividing wall is gone. You are now able to call your, the, your, the once you call enemies, your brother and sister, because the dividing wall is gone. Yet the author of Ephesians celebrates this new household of God, this overcoming of divisions as good news. Our experience at Atherton United Church will help us to grasp the idea of the good news in chapter 2 of Ephesians. We now are a multicultural church where we have people from Africa, an African minister, where we have people from Kenya, we have people from Papua New Guinea, people from Vanuatu, 
people from Tongan Islands, people from India. It becomes a more cultural. People from Australia, everyone is welcomed. In, <clears throat> in these days, we have made a certain discovery, a discovery which we did not seek and which we did not think was possible. We have seen our, with our own eyes and our own eyes that God is breaking down the dividing wall. It is being very flesh and blood, stumbling, bumbling, longing, hopeful, joyful journey for us to be what we are, calling ourselves a multicultural church. What does that mean? It means we are accepting everyone as they are. We are accepting everyone as brothers and sisters. In Jesus Christ, the dividing walls of hostility have been broken down. Though we are born into diversity, in earthly families, our life together has led us to affirm that we are called to be one family through the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are now one, not two. We are one family. I heard a story about a castle on the coast of England. No one currently was living in the castle and vandals were coming in and destroying the place. So the owner hired a contractor to build a nice rock wall around the castle. The fee was agreed upon and the contractor began his work. But after a short time, the contractor began having trouble finding rocks for the wall. So he called the owner to complain about the situation. The owner sharply replied, I don't care where you get the rocks. I want you to build that wall. Some time later, the owner came to see the progress of the work and found a beautiful high wall. He was immensely impressed with the fine work the contractor had done. It was a perfect wall for his castle. But then he went through the wall and was stunned to find out there was no castle. The contractor explained, there were all these wonderful rocks in that run-down old castle, so I used them. Be careful when you build the wall. What you can expect. Be careful what you can expect. Are there any barriers in your church or in your heart based on race, economics, or sex? Check your attitude and actions against scripture. If you find yourself out of accord with it, repent and ask God to help you. Don't put up walls where Christ has torn them down. Don't put them up. Christianity is the only religion in the world that can truly be described as an equal opportunity faith. All Christians stand on level ground before the cross of Jesus Christ. We are all the same. Young, old, male, female, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, black and white, every other color, we are all sinners in need of salvation. That's what brings us here. So when I look at that, I find that I am no better than anyone else. I am a beggar. Seeking to find where I can find, looking for where I can find bread. In conclusion, we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are now part of the people of God. To God be glory. Amen to that church. Tear down this wall. Christ has come into the world to reconcile us to one another and to God so that we become brothers and sisters. We are no longer talking of them. We are talking of us. Can you describe your relationship with others in the board as characterized by peace? How do you look at others? Do you want to bring peace with others? If so, thank God. Who alone makes it possible? If not, repent and ask God to give you grace to make those relationships right. Open your heart this day to the one who truly holds it all together. You open your heart so that let Christ reign. Let Christ take control. Let Christ take charge of your life. When Christ takes charge of your life, things will never be the same. You will never describe people with their background because you know that you are all created in the image of God. You are all children of God. May the good Lord bless you as you think upon these words where Paul is talking about in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. 
He is telling people to say only those with changed heart would know the difference. Only those who have accepted Christ as their personal savior would know who they are. Their identity is not rooted in their background. Their identity is rooted in who they believe in. And that is Jesus Christ, who is the savior of the world. May God bless you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for the love you have shown to us. We thank you that we are here. From being alien to becoming children of God. You call us to come from the mansions to the center. One in Christ, children of God. You call us to accept the care of a loving God and to find our place as a children of God. Not by birth, nor by human hands. We are one in you through your spirit. From commandment to covenant. Rather than rulers, you give us promise. We are yours and you are yours, ours. You call us to join hands with you and to dance time to you, the music. And we sing together in the language of the spirit. And that is the language of God. Bless us, Lord, as we are gathered here. From hopeless to hopeful, you invite us to look beyond the cross to see a resurrection of hope and joy. Thank you, Father. For we are not of this world, but we are in the world. You have brought us from hostility to reconciliation. You ask us to reach out in peace, to rejoin hands, hands across differences. You call us to become one in Christ, to see your image in, in every face, not by division, not by difference, but in unity and sharing we come to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I would urge you to take your offering. I always remind you that an offering is always a way of saying thank you, God. You are saying thank you, God, for what you have done to me. Thank you, God, for what you have done to my family. Thank you, God, just for looking after me to be where I am today. So please, remember, for the seven days, when I'm in seven days in every week, God has been looking after you. And there is something you need to come back and say, thank you, Lord. Let us pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these offerings. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you continuously remind us that without you we can't do anything. But with you we can do great things. Bless our offering, Father. Bless this offering. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. May God bless you all. Remember always to pray and thank God. In Jesus' name. Amen.